Blog Talk Radio. Hello out there, everybody. It is Tuesday, March 27th, 2012. I am David Dimzowski, founder of The Financial Bin and host of Financial Bin Radio. Before I introduce you to our guest today, let me share some quick notes with you. First off, don't forget to pick up your copy of Entrepreneur Intervention, Triumphs and Failures of Entrepreneurs. You can do so for just 99 cents on Apple's Light Bookstore, Kindle, Nook, and Sony Reader. You can also get a paperback copy for just under $10 at Amazon and CreateSpace. Go to financialbin.com, click on the book section at the very top, next to the login button for more information. Now, secondly, we're in the editing and formatting process for Landlord Intervention. I've told you about this for a couple couple weeks now. This is a book by a gentleman uh, who has been in the real estate rental business for over 20 years. He gives you a fantastic step-by-step how-to guide for, for you to begin your own career as a landlord. And we plan to release this book probably in late May of, of this year. And finally, we're still collecting submissions for Wealth Intervention, and we plan to release this book later this later this year as part of the Intervention series. It'll be the third installment, so uh, we're really kicking it off this year and trying to uh, and trying to further that book series. Now, let me introduce you to today's guest. His name is his name is Mitch Weiss. Mitch is a finance professor at the University of Hartford in Connecticut and the author of Life Happens: A Practical Guide to Personal Finance from College through Career. And he joins us right now. Uh, Mitch, welcome to Financial Bin Radio. Thank you, David. Uh, well, let's get right to it. Uh, the first question I have for you, Mitch, is can you give us a brief account of what you were doing prior to writing Life Happens and becoming a finance professor? Sure, sure. Um, well, uh, my career spans uh, a little bit more than 30 years uh, in the financial services uh, industry. Uh, I've owned and operated commercial finance companies. I've also been a senior executive at a couple of banks. Um, and uh, I guess I guess most of uh, most of my time has really been on the the lending side of things, uh, both to businesses and to uh, consumers. So, so can you take us through take us through the process of writing the book, and and and, and kind of give us a a brief account. You know, don't give too much away, but uh, kind of give us a brief account of what it entails and and how it's geared toward Generation Y. That's great. Uh, so, so the book really came about from a, uh, a, a course that I developed with a colleague for the university uh, uh, several years ago, when the uh, financial uh, crisis began to uh, uh, to blossom uh, or mushroom. <laughs> uh, it, became, it became pretty apparent that uh, that the college kids uh, weren't prepared, uh, their parents weren't prepared. There was an awful lot of stress and anxiety on campus, and. And uh, we decided to create a course for personal finance, uh, well, we called it personal financial management, teaching students really the nuts and bolts of uh, personal finance, things that were uh, important to them as they were going through college and preparing to leave college to go into uh, into the real world. Uh, I started teaching that course in the fall of 2009, and uh, a couple of semesters in, uh, yeah, I just became more and more frustrated with the textbooks that I had to work with. Uh, I read through about four or five of them. I was using one in particular that, that that's really quite good. The problem is that they're written by um, uh, finance academics, and they're written mostly in financial terms, uh, as much right. as they try to loosen up the language a bit. You know, in that first class that I had, I had 20, 12 different um, uh, majors represented, everything from ceramics to engineering, health services, and so forth. Uh, there, there was just no way to, to teach them finan- uh, personal finance from a, a finance major's perspective. It just wasn't going to work. So I thought about writing my own text for the course, and then I quickly set that aside and decided instead to write a, a mass market book because there's really nothing that's that's out there that that is comprehensive in nature and directed to young adults that are on both sides of college, those those that are coming into it, leaving high school either for work or, or college or a combination of the two, and those that are uh, the, those that are leaving. So, you know, that's, that's sort of how that came about. Well, you, you know, I, 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 when I was doing some research for uh, about you, I came across the fact that uh, you helped co-found it, I believe, it, at the University of Hartford, the Center for Personal Financial Responsibility. Can you kind of talk to us about that and, and why, or and, and why you believe maybe other colleges to kind of adopt that same philosophy? Because you know, whether it's high school or college, is really not a focus on personal finance. And you know, here you are, you, you're, you're offering courses at, at, at your school. Can you can you briefly tell us about that? 
Yeah, boy, you really did your homework. Uh, that, <laughs> that, the center, my colleague and I created the center uh, uh, really as uh, as a vehicle for outreach. Um, I've given uh, uh, talks in the community, in the greater Hartford community, and, and actually because of the book and the publicity surrounding the book, most recently I've been uh, way outside of the uh, the greater Hartford community. I I gave a talk in the beginning of the month at the University of Arkansas. Um, I uh, have speaking engagements that are that are set up for uh, uh, for New York, and uh, I was up in uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so the center itself was originally designed uh, to to move this type of education out into the Hartford, uh, the general, uh, the Greater Hartford community, and we and we still uh, we still do that. Uh, a few months ago, I, I spoke to a group of women uh, that are living uh, in a halfway house at a church uh, in Hartford. Uh, they are out of prison, out of rehab, uh, drug rehab, and trying to transition into um, into regular life. And they had all kinds of financial issues uh, there. So I, I was, you know, working with them to try to knock down each one of these problems that they had one at a time and send them to people that they needed to go to to see to try to work out their uh, their issues. So the center is the vehicle for that. And also on campus, through the center, um, we give presentations in different areas of the school. The uh, University of Hartford uh, is, a, you know, is a five 6,000 uh, uh, student school. It's a middle-of-the-road school. But it has these two interesting schools that are a part of it, uh, the Hart School for Performing Arts and the Hartford Arts School. So I've given talks at, at Hart, uh, the performing arts school, to music majors um, on the subject of personal finance, and I've also spoken to art majors. Uh, you know, so the center does all of this. The the university um, actually, uh, you know, in, in a very nice way, surprised me and and uh, and has let me use this book, which was designed for mass market as the uh, primary textbook for this semester. We're, we're doing an experiment with this book. Can a mass market book be used to teach hmm. college students? Um, I, so I've created a workbook that goes along with this. Uh, that workbook's not out for sale because I'm testing it this semester. Hmm. And if it works, I mean, the, the class was sold out, uh, you know, which is great. Some of my classes wow. are. Uh, but um, if this works, then, you know, maybe this 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 book that I wrote to be the anti-textbook um, actually can work in a, a classroom setting for college students. P part of this, you know, to touch on another aspect of your question, mm -hmm. when when we were looking at creating the center, we took a survey of colleges in the three states contiguous to, Ma uh, to Connecticut, so Mass, Rhode Island, New York, and what we found was less than 25% of all of the colleges offered a credit-eligible course in personal finance. The, wow. the expectation is that mom and dad taught you this stuff before you came into school. Right, right. Now, now, how, now how's the book being received? I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how's the book being received uh, along with the workbook in, in the class now? I mean, is it going well? Well, uh, the class just be the first class was last night actually. Uh, oh, oh, the, okay, okay. The personal finance course is taught as a, um, you know, I prefer to teach this as a seven week uh, course where the students meet twice a week. Uh, rather than the 14 or 15 week normal semester, um, you know this this particular content. No one gets really excited about this stuff. You know, you, as right. you can imagine. Sure. So, uh, you know, stretching it out over 14, 15 weeks, I've learned that uh, while that could work, it, it, there's too much time in between each one of the sessions. So uh, instead, it burdens me. But I teach it on Monday and Wednesday nights for two and a half hours each one of those nights, and uh, wow. it started uh, yeah last night. <laughs> but, but you know, the good news was they left class last night, and and no one said, "Oh God, this this course sucks." And, and, and they, they dropped it, <laughs> right? And they right, dropped right. it. So you know, I didn't get any of that. <laughs> but um, I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful that they'll respond well to this. Now, now you, you mentioned that you, you give talks to art majors and performing art majors. How, what what kind of questions are they asking? What what is their main concern? Because that that's a really unique group and. You know, obviously they're not. They're you know they probably got to take some kind of business course, I imagine, at some point. But um, yeah, I mean that that would be interesting to me because you know they they'd be I would imagine they'd be one of the majors that's that's leaving uh, University of Hartford or another school and having a really tough try time finding a job. So can you take well, us through that a little bit? Yeah, I mean their questions 
um, are really the same as, as all the other students' questions. They, 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 they revolve around student debt, student loans, and also making budgets work for real life. Uh, those are the, really the two key areas. For the, for the art students, music students, uh, performing arts, art students and such, you know, they have additional questions about um, how to be in business for themselves, how to manage that mm. business. And, in fact, um, I am writing a book uh, right now um, uh, for small businesses and professional practices that will cover that. It's, uh, you know, it's really a, another guide for for those that decide that they want to go into business for themselves. Uh, it's a corporate finance book without being a, um, you know, make my eyes bleed corporate finance book. <laughs> right, uh, right. <laughs> Right, you know the same approach is taken in this book. So, so they're 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 interested in in in, um, in information about the same things that all the other students are. They're they're getting crushed with student loans. They're scared to death about this as they come out of school. They didn't prepare really well for it. Um, I there was a Hartford or a Hart uh, performing arts student that uh, asked to see me last year after a talk I'd given at the school. And I actually used uh, that little talk as a uh, as an anecdote that I put in the book. She was finishing her master's program at at Hart and moving into the city. I think she was going to go to she was going to one of the city universities in Manhattan, and she was continuing for an advanced degree. And she was already had about forty fifty thousand dollars worth of uh, student loan debt. And it looked like she was going to take on another twenty or thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars by the time that it was done. So it was an eighty thousand uh, dollar load of debt that she was carrying. Wow. And we worked through, you know, her budget. She was really well prepared. I mean, I, I found that some of the art students, music students, are just so incredibly on top of their game in this regard. But uh, she was very well prepared. She knew exactly what she had in mind, and and I just moved her around a little bit. She was thinking, for example, she was thinking that she was going to move into the city and she had a car. And my my um, suggestion to her was that she didn't need to live in Manhattan. She could live in one of the boroughs for a little bit less money and buy a hundred dollar subway pass and get around, uh, you know, as much as she could uh, as she wanted. And secondly, the car, which she owned free and clear, it could actually be sold at this point because she's going to be in the city for a number of years. Right. And sold and then used to apply against the principal balance of one of her higher interest loans, and she's going to do that. You know, so we so we talked about how to make the pieces fit, and then we we discussed um, the part time work that she was going to do, how she was going to pay the interest on her loans that was accruing since she didn't have an un, she had an unsubsidized Stafford loan where the government was not paying the interest for her. So how she would take part time jobs, uh, made a couple of suggestions to her where she could find some of that part time work. And then we we came up with, you know, a number that she would be um, carrying as far as debt load is concerned. And then we talked about what her um, post-college employment prospects would be. And she has really good prospects. I mean, she'd be teaching and doing some other things and performing. So, you know, the sense that I have is that she'd earn somewhere between $60,000 and $80,000 a year right out of college based on what she was qualified for. Well, with that in mind, if she was carrying seventy or eighty thousand dollar debt, that's one to one for the first year salary post grad. Yeah. Uh, that's that's manageable. You can right. do that. So you know that that's kind of the discussions that that I have with students. She was no different than my business majors, my engineering majors, chemistry majors. You know, they're all worried about the same stuff there. Now, now, Mitch, uh, you know what you what you just walked us through right there with this student. Uh, for those listeners that haven't had a chance to read your book yet, is that some of the things you touch on there that you kind of take people through through it just like that? Yes, uh, I wrote the book from the perspective of a uh, financial services insider, and in particular, um, I'm concentrating on on credit. How do you get it? How do you manage it once you have it? How do you protect it? And what do you do when things head sideways on you? Uh, all of the uh, the voices that are out there on personal finance, um, none of them come from the lending side of the financial services industry. Right. And, and frankly, I have very few colleagues of mine that are willing to do what I do. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my career uh, uh, that I have the ability to uh, to work for uh, three thousand dollars a course, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, and, and to write. And to write this material, both both right. for book purposes and also all of the articles, there are very few in the financial services industry willing to do that. They love being a guest star. You know, they love coming into a class to give a presentation, 
but they don't want to prep for 15 week semesters. Uh, so I, you know, I wrote the book from that standpoint, talking about all kinds of loans, credit cards, leases, um, uh, student loans, and giving rules of thumb, guidelines. You know, how much debt should you have in total? How much should your living, uh, should your uh, mortgage or rent be? Uh, you know, in this regard, how do you how do you build together a budget that you could manage? Yeah, switching gears here a little bit, uh, focusing on your blog a little bit, I was able to check that out a little bit too. And you know, I saw an article on there from March 8th. You, you touched on uh, strategic default. Can you kind of walk us through what that is and, and give the basics for the listeners? Right. Well, that that particular topic actually is separate from uh, from the student uh, from the student loan crisis. Right. Uh, you know, th- this one pertains to uh, uh, mortgages, and mm-hmm. there are a bunch of states in the country, you know, a dozen or so states in the country that have what are called, um, uh, or more than a dozen actually, uh, anti- anti-recourse uh, legislation uh, or non-recourse legislation on the books, which effectively means that um, if you were to uh, default on a debt for a first mortgage on a house, a um, purchase money mortgage on a house, technically, uh, and you were to default on that, and the bank were to foreclose on that loan, take possession of the house, uh, in effect, sell it, and if they were to uh, realize proceeds that are less than uh, the amount of the mortgage, in a non-recourse state like uh, Arizona, California, Nevada, in a non-recourse state, uh, they can't pursue you. They can't sue you for that difference. So uh, there are many that have talked about it, and there are websites that have been set up and and people that have been banging the drum about this saying, you know, uh, the bank screwed us. They got us into this mess. Um, You know, if you're you're underwater on your mortgage, you owe more against the house than what it's worth. You should just toss the keys, walk away. So you take a um, you take a uh, credit score whack for for a few years, big deal, you know. Screw the banks because they uh, they got you into it. From from my standpoint, you know, I'm not a I'm not a bank lover. I come from banking. I come from financial services, but uh, you know, there's plenty that the banks do wrong, uh, you know, as well. In this regard, though, I have a real problem with it. You know, from an ethical standpoint. You could make the argument that it is ethical to do this and that it's not illegal and in some states it's generally accepted practices or it's become generally accepted practices. From a moral standpoint, it just goes against it goes against me and, and primarily for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, credit itself, the decision to, to lend people money, credit is based on trust. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to lend you money if I think that you're going to decide not to pay me. Not that you don't have the ability to pay me, but that you decide not to pay me. In strategic default, the, the folks that are defaulting strategically, this uh, this euphemism, they have the ability to pay the mortgage. They're just choosing not to, to take advantage of uh, a market condition and the laws that are favorable to this in that particular state. Uh, so that co- that undermines the whole concept of credit. And, and the reaction uh, will be strong, and it is already, you know, happening in those states where the banks are doing business. You know, all banks, all lenders make four basic decisions. Are they going to lend you money? How much are they going to lend you? What rate are they going to charge? And what terms and conditions are they going to apply? Those are the basic four decisions that they make. So if I'm going to lend in a particular state where I know that someone can walk away from a mortgage, you know, particularly if they find themselves underwater, if, if housing prices go down even further, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to want more down payment, no more 10 or 20 percent. I want more than that. And because of the heightened risk, I want more rate, and I want more right. fees, and I'm going to tighten up the terms and conditions. So the consequences are that maybe the person that strategically defaults walks away with it, but the people that follow are harmed as a result. And to me, that's amoral. You know, so so I have a problem with it from that perspective. Uh, no one has written about it this way. I have been, uh, I've been interviewed on this on this topic as well. And you're asking me the question too. I mean, I have a very hardcore view about it, a very black and white, right and wrong about it. I I think it's a wrong thing to do. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's exactly the type of stance you need to have. I mean, it, it, the same goes with student loans. You know, there's there, there's talk of you know forgiving them if if you. You know, you work well, for the federal I, government after 10 years or something like that. But, I mean, there's a res- you, you took the loan. Well, you accepted let's, the let's, loan. Let's, you you let's agreed to the terms. 
Well, let's talk okay. about that on student loans because sure. it's slight, something Please. slightly different about that. On the student loans, I actually I have I have an issue with the. Uh, 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 with the fact that student loans are nearly impossible to discharge in bankruptcy. They're not right. impossible to discharge. They're nearly impossible. There's something called the Brunner Test. Uh, the Brunner Test, as it's applied, you have to, in effect, demonstrate multi-generational harm, uh, that these loans, you cannot possibly pay them back. You know, you're, you'll be destitute for the rest of your life. Very, very high uh, standard, very hard uh, test to pass. So for all intents and purposes, they're, uh, they're bankrupt-proof. Uh, and now this change in the bankruptcy law was lobbied for by the private lenders uh, and was put into effect in 2005. The problem with that is that because bankruptcy is off the table, from a lender's standpoint, if I know that, and I'm not saying that I would act this way and I never have, but if I know and I weren't so inclined uh, to look at a lender and know that that person didn't have another way out of the room, then why should I negotiate? So if that person says to me, I can't pay the loan, my response is tough. And what I'm seeing with students that I've been counseling as they've been approaching their private lenders, let's put aside the government for the moment, the mm -hmm. private lenders the private lenders are, are saying, in effect, uh, pay me, tough. Uh, yeah, we'll extend it out. You pay me over 20 years, 25 years, but you're going to pay me. No, I'm not going to reduce the interest rate. No, I'm not going to reduce the amount that you owe me. In the, in the private lender side, here they now enjoy the ability to stand shoulder to shoulder with the federal government in not having their debt discharged. So they've taken a huge amount of risk off the table. But yet okay. the interest rates that are being charged by the private lenders are a multiple of what the government charges. So how is that fair? So I'm actually advocating that the bankruptcy laws be changed so that students can declare bankruptcy, not because I want them to, but because then the the, le the private lenders would have the incentive to negotiate with them. You know, it just levels the playing field. Mitch, let, let, let's take it like 10 years out. Where, where do you see all this falling? I mean, we just had, you know, we had the, the whole crisis with the, with the mortgages, and now, you know, I think it was last year, according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, student loan debt officially hit the $1 trillion mark. Where, where does Mitch Weiss see this, see this going? I think this is a debacle. You know, these these kids cannot carve out a life for themselves. I think it is a it's a huge drag on the economy. Uh, they, you know, I met a. Um, if you look through the blog, there was a um, a posting about uh, 20 years of payments. You know, mm -hmm. very briefly um, described. There was a, uh, a cab driver I had. He was a young guy. He was a year out of school, and we started talking. Uh, you know, I'll always talk to somebody that's around college age, just to get their sense of how things are going. Sure. And I asked him how he was doing, and he told me that he graduated with a uh, degree. It was construction science management. And, you, and that degree in, in regular times would, would ensure that he has a forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 job right out of college. Sure. It's, a, it's an attractive degree. But he couldn't find a job in these times, so he's been putting together a bunch of uh, part-time gigs. And he told me that he's making enough money to be able to not live at home so he's living, he's sharing an apartment with a couple of friends, but he said that he's carrying between forty and fifty thousand dollars of student debt, which was about the right amount considering what job that he could have walked into. But he didn't walk into that job. He's earning less, and that forty or fifty thousand dollars is about four hundred dollars a month in payments for him. And that four hundred dollars, he told me, made the difference of him having a car or not because two hundred dollars for a lease on a car plus another two hundred dollars to cover your insurance and miscellaneous. He said, you know, I can't make it work. So what you're seeing are, are these young people coming out of school, delaying marriage, delaying purchases, you know, large ticket purchases, you know, mm -hmm. delaying life because they have this gigantic rock hanging over them. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a debacle. I think that it needs to be addressed. Um, and you could point the finger and say, you know, well, it was their fault for getting into this. You're right. It's their fault for not being properly educated, properly prepared to understand what it is that they are getting into. You know, that's absolutely correct. But at the same time, you have uh, complicity on the part of the colleges and the lenders, both government sure. and private sure. lenders, because the world keeps spinning. The, 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 uh, the rates, the tuition rates uh, are still high, and the loans facilitate you going to school, and you, you come out with debt that you just can't possibly afford. 
Well, yeah, I guess especially when you take into account the you know the degree mills and the places like that that kind of just take your money and don't really offer you uh, a lot of value in return. Well, you know that's that's a, that's a whole other topic for another time. There was yeah. an article that I read over the summer about um, you know the the out, uh, uh, looking at outcomes. What percentage of students actually graduate that start college nationally? Fifty right. percent of the students that begin college actually graduate. Yeah, and I saw that today. I saw an article about that today. Yeah. Okay. Well, in on the online schools, the uh, the uh, uh, the private uh, the the for profit online schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rate that, that I read about was somewhere closer to ten percent, and that's wow. you know, I mean, that's just extraordinary. And and the online schools, as I've read about, and I, I haven't researched this for myself to see whether this is true, uh, but they suck up an awful lot of the uh, the government uh, funding that's available. So that's why people hey, you're are right. jumping down and say, you know, well, the government shouldn't make these loans. The, the, for the the good news about the government in this regard is, you know, they are actually trying to do something to help the students because they have a responsibility because they help them get into this. So right. when you talk about forgiveness of debt, I don't have a problem with a student that's willing to spend five years in a Title One school, you know, in a school that you bring a gun to, you know, <laughs> spend five yeah. years in a Title One school and then have their debt forgiven. Uh, I just was interviewed by uh, a young woman who's actually completing her master's degree and will be doing that uh, on purpose, you know, working in an inner city, inner city really difficult school mm-hmm. so that she'll be able to discharge her debt by giving her uh, service back to the country. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. The government's also created something called income-based re- uh, repayment programs where the payment is pegged to uh, affordability. You know, this is how much you're earning, and every year you have to requalify for this so that they know that you're paying your fair share, you know, relative to how much, you know, your your salary is in your household, uh, how large your household is. So the government's actually doing stuff. That's why I said uh, it's the private lenders, my brethren, you know, that I'm taking issue with because they're enjoying very high rates with a risk that's been curtailed to a large extent, in my opinion. All right, Mitch, we, we have about a minute left, so a couple things. Uh, can you give the Generation Wires out there one tip and then tell everyone how they can pick up the book and get in, and get in contact with you and your blog? Sure. Uh, the tip is to stay current. You know, you've got all of these fabulous blogs that are out there. and There are so many people that are writing about these subjects. I, I, I know now because I've been interviewed by a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> so there, there's great stuff that's out there. There's a wealth of material that's out there. You've got to stay current. You've got to read about this stuff. And in particular, on Twitter, um, you know, just search for, you know, Wall Street Journal, Personal Finance, Money, uh, sure. USA Today Money, and all the rest. You can find things that, that will keep you up to date. As to the book, the uh, the site is uh, lifehappensbook, uh, singular, book.com, and uh, there you'll see uh, samples, excerpts from the book. You'll see some background uh, on this. You'll, you'll get a sense for how this thing was written and why it was put together the way that it was and where to buy it. All right, Mitch, I really appreciate your time. I'm sorry I kept you a little bit over today, but uh, it was a really great conversation. I, I know I learned a lot, and I'm sure the listeners did as well. So, you know, when you're ready to to, to launch that next book about the small businesses, please, we'll, we'll, we'll be more than willing to have you back on. It's been It's been a pleasure. David, thank you very much. I appreciate the time as well. All right. Well, you have a great night. Thank you very much. You too. Bye. All right, folks, we have about a minute and a half left here. That was... Author and professor, uh, professor, finance professor at University of Hartford. His name is Mitch Weiss. Make sure to check him out there. He's got a blog, and make sure to check out the lifehappensbook.com. We'll, we'll post it on the website. Make sure that you guys can check him out and buy the book. Uh, you know, remember also buy our book too, Entrepreneur Intervention: Tribes and Failures of Entrepreneurs. Uh, it's available for various e-readers, including Kindle and your iPad. And you can, all you got to do is go go to the very top, click on the login button next, or next to the login button for more information. It's it's the book section. And remember, we are we are putting out landlord intervention and wealth intervention later this year, so be on the lookout for that as well. And I I got to wrap it up here, fellas. So my name is David Dimzowski. I'm the founder of the Financial Bin and your host of Financial Bin Radio. Till next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>